Hi everyone, my name is Ben Zamzo and this is a guest lecture to introduce week number six. Here we're going to be introduced to the concept of inflation. So inflation is just an increase in the average level of prices, typically measured using changes in a price index. A price index is just the average price from a representative basket of goods and services in the economy. So the inflation rate is just the percentage change in the price index from one year to the next. Formally, this is just the price in period 2 minus the price in period 1 divided by price in period 1. Then you take this ratio times 100 and it gives a percentage. For instance, a 2% inflation rate means goods are priced 2% higher than in the base year. Inflation is distinct from typical price fluctuations we might see in the equilibrium price caused by supply and demand shocks. Inflation refers to changes in the average level of all prices. So inflation means on average prices have risen, though it's possible that individual prices of some goods have actually fallen. We have many price indexes to measure, pr measure inflation. So for instance, the consumer price index, or CPI, the GDP deflator, and the producer price index, the PPI. The CPI, Consumer Price Index, comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS. It reports the price of a market basket of goods presumably purchased by a typical urban consumer. This covers like 80,000 goods in something like 200 categories. And it's weighted so that an increase in the price of a major item like housing costs more than a rise in a price of paper towels, for instance. The CPI for any particular year is found by taking the price of the market basket in that year divided by the price estimate for the same market basket in a base year, then that ratio times 100. The CPI for the base year is always 100, and the BLS is setting our base year as 1982 to 1984, so the CPI is equal to 100 for that year. Now the GDP deflator is the ratio of nominal GDP to real GDP multiplied by 100. It counts all final goods since it's based on GDP. The GDP deflator measures the current price level relative to the prices of the base year. Both CPI and GDP deflator are useful, but they're not always going to agree. The, C the GDP deflator uses the prices of all final goods and services, but the CPI uses the prices of consumption goods and services only, so of course they're going to differ. Also, the GDP deflator weights each item using information about current and past quantities, but the CPI weights information only from a past consumer expenditure survey. So the GDP deflator incorporates quality improvements and substitution effects in a way that the CPI does not. Now, while in principle the GDP deflator might not have as many issues or the same issues as the CPI, it actually does in practice because the physical quantities produced are not directly measured. Instead, we take expenditures that are divided by price indices, one of which is the CPI itself. So the producer price index measures the average price received by producers. This counts both final and intermediate goods, unlike the GDP deflator or the CPI. And there's a producer price index for, a vari for various industries. So now while we have a variety of price indices to use, typically the consumer price index, CPI, is the preferred measure to think of if we're interested in the effect of inflation on average citizens. So typically, we're going to focus on the CPI unless otherwise noted. There's some issues with using the CPI. Notably, the composition of the market basket is not constant over time. There's changes in the types of items available. New goods are introduced. Innovations replace obsolete goods. And this does introduce some error into the measure, even though the CPI is designed to account for it. One goal of having the CPI in the first place is to measure changes in the cost of living. We want to think about the income increase necessary to maintain a standard of living when prices rise. So CPI is subject to what's called the substitution bias, in that prices are not changing proportionally year to year, meaning that consumers can respond by switching to less expensive alternatives. This, in, this can lead to the cost of living being overstated year to year. Another issue is the introduction of new goods. This gives consumers more variety and reduces the cost of maintaining a given level of well-being. 
but the CPI does not reflect the increase in the value of, of a dollar resulting from an increase in the variety of goods available to purchase using that dollar. There's also unmeasured quality changes mentioned earlier. If quality rises from year to year, the value of a dollar rises. The BLS tries to maintain a basket of constant quality, but quality is really difficult to measure and capture. So the average inflation rate in the U.S. since 1950 has been about 3.3 percent. During the 70s it was higher and recently it's been lower, maybe around 2 percent or less. So a basket that cost $10 in 1913 would cost $36.17 in 1969, $100 in 1982, and $233 in 2013. The CPI is used to compute real prices corrected for inflation. Real, pri real prices are used to compare the prices of goods over time. There are different sources of inflation. Demand pull inflation arises when there's too much money and too few goods. This occurs when the money supply is too large and resources are already fully employed and firms can't respond to access demand by raising output. Cost push inflation occurs when there's factors leading to an increase in per unit production costs. The output falls while prices rise, so costs are pushing the price level upward. Anyway, you want to be sure to carefully read through the assigned chapter reading, pay special attention to our definitions, and trying to understand and clarify our basic, basic concepts, as this will serve you well in the course.